Good morning, church. I'd like to welcome you again on behalf of our pastor, Pastor Dean, uh, who is not around this morning with his family. Our prayer is that grace and glory would shine on their path and that the Lord would bring them here again. Uh, together with all our brethren, we are not around today in Jesus' name. It's time for the word. However, I would like us to pray. Can we have that text on the screen now, please? Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6 happened to be an encounter that Isaiah had when in that year where King Uzziah died. Isaiah 6 from verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. It had six wings. All right? With two, he covered the space, and with two, he covered his feet, and with two, he flew. And one called to another and said, Oli, Oli, Oli is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundation of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king. The Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken from the tongues from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Verse 8, where we would stop. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. And he said, go and say to these people, amen. Beloved, we will pray for three things today before we go into the word of God. The first is that the Lord will open our eyes, that we will see the Lord. You see, what makes sense in any step an individual takes on earth is the ability to see the Lord in every step we take. The second thing we'll be asking the Lord to do is to take away our guilt and our sin by forgiving us all our trespasses. And the third is we're going to be asking the Lord, through your word today, influence me to influence others. All right? That is clear, right? Let's pray together. Bow your heads with me. And I'd like you to just talk to the Lord and say, Lord, open my eyes. The writer of, of that song says, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I want to see you. So see you eye and lift it up, shining in the light of your glory. So can you just say, Lord, open my eyes to see this morning. I want to see you as I worship. I want to see you in every sphere of my life. Wherever I turn to, wherever I go, I want to see you. Parents, can we pray for our kids? Lord, I want to see you in the life of my children. I want to see you in their schoolwork, in their businesses. I want to see you in what they lay their hands on. Can we pray, Lord, I want to see you in my family, at work, over all the issues of my life. Do you have anything important and significant you want to do this week? Can you just say, Lord, I want to see you right here at work. Fight my battles, win my wars, glorify yourself. Pray. As I hear the word being preached this morning, I want to see you. I do not want to see anyone speaking to me, but I want to see you. And so the second part of the prayer is to say, Lord, I acknowledge that I am a sinner. Forgive me. Isaiah got to a point where he saw his sin and his uncleanness, and he said, woe is me. Can we just say, Lord, I am a sinner, and I acknowledge that. For the Bible says, if we say we do not sin, we lie, and there is no truth in us. But if we confess and forsake our sins, He will have mercy on us. So can we just say, Lord, have mercy on me? Can we plead the blood of Jesus to cleanse us and purify us from all our sin? Can we ask the blood of Jesus to make us whole this morning? Lastly, pray. Father, through your word today, influence me 
that I may influence my world. Let your word come to me today, Lord. Through the reading of the word, through the sharing of the word, let your word come to me. I'd like you to add this one to it, Lord. As your word comes today, let your word heal the sick. Let your word turn situations around. Some of our brethren are not here now. We pray that as they listen to the word, that the word of God will heal them. The Bible says, and he was present to heal all of their infirmity. Lord Jesus, as your word has been broken today, please be present to heal all infirmity. Bring your prayers to a close. Pray with me now. Lord, we are so grateful and so thankful because we have a privilege of coming before you as a church to pray as we wait on you to hear your word. I ask, Lord, that you would speak to us. Ancient words ever true. Come, change me, change your people. Influence me, influence your people. That at this time, when we listen to you, Lord, you will do amazing things in our midst. Let your word heal the sea. Let your word do wonderful things in our lives. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. All right. We are studying through the book of Acts of Apostles. If you have your Bibles here, you would want to turn with me to chapter 25. I would be leading our thoughts as we discuss from Acts of Apostles 25 all through to Acts of Apostles 26 and verse 23. One of the things I would do is to try as much as possible to call your attention to few things as the Lord had laid it on my heart. The movement continues with defense, and that is what we're looking at. Oh, by the way, we were not in person last Sunday because of the turbulent storms and the outage of power. Uh, Pastor Dean preached the word and placed it online without trying to put anybody into trouble. Um, how many of us listened or watched the message last Sunday? All right, all right, okay. If you have not done that, and that's going to be your take home assignment for today, you know, so take time to go online and watch it. The, the, the beautiful thing is it's a sequence. I don't want you to miss any part of it. So, so your take home assignment is to go back to chapter 24, okay? I'm gonna start from chapter 25 today. All right, so let's read. Let's read the scriptures first. I'd like to read chapter 25, yes, from verse 1. Now, three days after Festus had arrived in the province, he went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. And the chief priests and the principal men of the Jews laid out their case against Paul. And they urged him, asking as a favor against Paul, that he summoned him to Jerusalem because they were planning an ambush to kill him on the way. Festus replied that Paul was being kept at Caesarea and that he himself intended to go there shortly. So he said, let the men of authority among you go down with me. And if there is anything wrong about the man, let them bring charges against him. After he stayed among them not more than eight or 10 days, he went down to Caesarea, and the next day he took his seat on the tribuna and ordered Paul to be brought. When he had arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many and serious charges against him that they could not prove. Paul urged his defense, in his defense, Neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar, have I committed any offense. But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Do you wish to go to Jerusalem and there be tried on these charges before me? But Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal, where I ought to be tried. To the Jews, I have done no wrong, as you yourself know very well. If then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything, 
for which I deserve to die. I do not seek to escape death. But if there is nothing to their charges against me, no one can give me up to them. I appeal to Caesar. Verse 12, where we pause. The Festus, when he had conferred with his council, answered, To Caesar you have appealed, to Caesar you shall go. All right. The movement continues with defense. Let me give you my background definition for defense that I'm going to be working with. Defense, in this case, comes from the Latin word defendere, which means ward off or protect. Defense means the act of protecting or guiding against attack, harm, or danger. Defense can also refer to the justification or denial in response to a charge, and that is going to be the context we are looking at. The movement of the disciples, the apostolic work of the, the men who ran with the gospel, how they referred to the word of God, bringing about justification in response to the charge that was laid against them. And so, our basic test today, like I said, is Acts of Apostles 25. We will run through chapter 26 and verse 23. Let me call your attention to the realities before us today. The realities before us today, number one, is that the book of Acts of Apostles documents the accounts and matters of the life of men and women like us. I'd like you to note that Acts of Apostles is not uh, a book written in the blues. It's men and women like us, ordinary men and women, who did extraordinary things because of the spirit of the living God that was living on the inside of them. And the reason why I have to say this is, the Bible is not a storybook. It's the account of people, individual like you and I, who chose to do something unique. You know, we began our study from the arrest of Paul uh, from Jerusalem and how Paul knew his identity. And last week, the pastor taught us about how he was kept safe, safe and secured. Today, we will consider that the movement begins with the defense. So, from our text today, we shall identify the lives and the roles of four characters. Today, we will look at the Jews, how the Jews brought allegations against Paul. Number two, we will also look at Apostle Paul and his defense, how Apostle Paul stood and defended the faith that came to him. Number three, we will also look at the man called Pusius Festus. Festus was the person that took over from Felix. Last week, we learned about Felix in Acts of Apostles 24. And we will also learn about a political ruler called King Agrippa. So this will be the four basic characters that we'll look at in the text today. Now, Acts of Apostles 24, Felix was the ruler. And because Felix wanted to play some political games, with the Jews, he did what was wrong. So, if you look into your Bible, you would see in Acts of Apostles 24, verse 27, the last verse, he said that Paul was left in prison by Felix for two years. And 25 told us that Festus took over power. Now, Apostle Paul was left in prison by Felix, a leader who played politics with the apostles' freedom by postponing his verdict. Permit me to read here from Acts of Apostles 24, from verse 24 to 27. After several days, Felix returned with his wife, Drusilla, who was a Jewess. He sent from Paul and listened to him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. As Paul expounded on righteousness, self-control, and judgment, 
Felix became frightened and said, you may go for now. When I find time, I will call for you. Now, let me take a pause here. Paul actually undoed three things that are so important that even today, people don't want to hear. The first is the issue of righteousness. Felix was not a righteous person. In fact, the Bible told us that the woman he married was wrongfully married. So Apostle Paul spoke to him about righteousness. Number two, Apostle Paul spoke to him about self-control. And number three, Apostle Paul spoke to him about the coming judgment. At this point, Felix became frightened. He became alarmed. And he said, just go away for now. I do not want to hear this again. We live in a world where when a preacher or when the word of God is touching sensitive parts of our life, we don't want to hear again, you know? When the preacher is preaching the truth and it's eating us, we don't want to hear again. And he said, I will call for you later. Then look at the next verse. At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe. Are you kidding me? <laughs> and you know that is the truth today. People in power think for, for you to enjoy a benefit or something else, probably you would offer bribes. So he sent for Paul frequently and talked to him. After two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus, and wishing to do the Jews a favor, he left Paul in prison. Everybody look at me. Felix thought he was doing the Jews a favor. He left Paul in prison. He never knew he was just acting out the script. Everything I would teach today is acting out the script. Ask me, how do I know? Jesus appeared to Paul. He said, because you have testified in Jerusalem. You will also do what? You will also testify in Rome. Take courage. You remember that was where we ended the message two weeks ago. So everything that happened between Jerusalem and Rome is just part of the script. Jesus already said it. And I like to lay a foundation here. Everything Jesus had told you, either in the written word or the spoken word through his servants, is true. Hold on to it. It will come to pass. Jesus said, take courage. You have testified in Jerusalem. You will also testify in Rome. So the guy thought, oh, I'm going to punish him a bit. I'm going to keep him there. You are not punishing him. It's part of the script. If you had released him, then the word of Jesus would not come to pass. Do you agree with me? So, sometimes people think when you do evil against a child of God, you are punishing the child of God. No, you are not. What the enemies meant for evil is going to turn it around for your good. All right. So, the question here is, how would you keep a person in prison to do other people a favor? That is terrible. It is a sign of the fallen age, the manifestation of the wickedness of the art of man. Jeremiah 17, verse 9 and 10, the Bible says, the art of man is desperately wicked. Above all, who can know it? In verse 10, God says, I, the Lord, started the art of all men. So let's go into our text. Acts 25, verse 1 to 5. Like I read a while ago, the scriptures introduced us to a new governor by the name of Festus. And he must deal with the problem of Paul because immediately he came to power, the Jews came to him. And they said, sir, there is a man in prison by the name Paul. Can you bring him back to Jerusalem to be tried? What the Jewish leaders had in mind 
is that if Paul is brought back to Jerusalem, they would assassinate him on the way. So, rather than bring him to Jerusalem, Festus said, no, I am also on my way to Caesarea. Join me at Caesarea, and let's begin a new trial. And so, from verse 6 to 12, the Jews arrived at Caesarea, and they brought false charges against Paul. And Paul counters everything they have said. All what he kept saying is, that is not true. What you said is not true. So, the Bible told us that Festus saw that Paul was innocent. But because he wants to be a positive representative of Rome, so he asked Paul, would you want me to transfer your case to Jerusalem? You know, they really wanted Paul back in Jerusalem so that he could be killed. But Paul refused. And he told Festus that you already have jurisdiction over me here and now. And then he drops the bomb by telling them, I want to be tried by Caesar, who happened to be the emperor. He, he appealed to a higher court. You know, Paul is a Roman citizen, and so Festus had no choice but to comply. So the case was taken away from the Sanhedrin. So to speak, it became a state case. He said, take me to the higher court. And so Acts of Apostles from chap chapter 25, from verse 13, Paul met with the religious and the cultural leaders. The Bible told us about a king called Agrippa, who together with his sister and lover, Bernice, you know, they came to town. And Agrippa happened to be a political leader. So Festus asked Agrippa for help. And what is the help he asked for? He said, look, there is a case of a man here called Paul. He is innocent. But Paul had appealed to speak to Caesar. I cannot send him to Caesar without writing a note that this is what he has done wrong. Do you remember that for Jesus to even be crucified, they had to write his punishment on his cross? Do you remember? How many of us remember? He said he is the king of the Jews. That was written on the cross. Because you do not condemn a citizen without putting what he has done wrong there. But this time around, Paul did not do anything wrong. There, there was no record of negative account against him. And so he needed to write something, and he told Agrippa, if you would want to meet with Paul so that we can agree together on what to write. And so Agrippa agreed. So in Acts of Apostles chapter 25, from verse 23 to 27, Festus began to recount how they had brought Paul to him and how they wanted him to kill Paul and how he needed someone to write what to be written, to be sent to Caesar. So I am in Acts of Apostles 26, from verse 1. Acts of Apostles 26, verse 1. King Agrippa said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. And then Paul stretched out his hand and proceeded to make his defense. All right. Paul gave the history of his life from beginning. And I'm going to tell you four things Paul spoke about before the king. Number one, Paul ascribed the truth to the resurrection of the dead. I believe in the resurrection of the dead, and that is why I am suffering what I'm suffering. Let's see verse 8. Acts of Apostles 26, verse 8. Very funny question. And don't see it as an elementary question, and don't see it as a college question. But let's see verse 8. Acts 26, verse 8. Funny question. The Bible says, Why? Is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? Is it incredible? Do you think it is? You know, if you believe God can do all things, then it should not be incredible that God raises people from the dead. 
And most times, what people want to deny is a reality. So Apostle Paul said, one of the reasons I am in chain is because I ascribe truth to the resurrection. Number two, because of my great respect for the Mosaic law. Number three, because I devoted myself to traditional belief of which I was the one pursuing Christians. And lastly, because I did not recount everything I said. I'm going to give us technically three things that Paul gave an account for. And this will be the three things that I would want us to keenly look at. And then I will bring the message home and we will pray. From verse 12 to 32, Apostle Paul gave an account of his conversion. How he was going from Jerusalem to Damascus, and how Jesus met him on the way, and Jesus Christ said, Saul, Saul, why are thou persecuting me? So he gave the account of how the Lord Jesus met him. And now when he rose up, he was blind. The question here for every one of us is, the account of your conversion is important. Don't trade it. You see, we cannot be true witnesses of Jesus if we can't retell how we gave our lives to Jesus. How did you find faith in Jesus? That is the story somebody's waiting for. You know, when we were young, there is a hymn we used to sing. We have a story to tell to the nations, Girls Auxiliary, years ago, you know? We all have a story to tell to the nation, and that is how we came to faith. In defense, the first thing Apostle Paul shared was how he came to Jesus. Number two, he gave an account of his commission. Look at the commission here, verse 16 to 18. Chapter 26, verse 16 to 18. But arise, stand on your feet. For this purpose, I have appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you. Let me take a break there before I read 17 and 18. Do you know, as at Acts chapter 9, Jesus Christ told Paul, you would be a witness not unto what I've told you, but of the things I will appear to you. Do you know Jesus appeared to Paul again? And one of it was the one I ended the message with two weeks ago. Take courage. You will testify as you have testified in Jerusalem, you will testify in Rome. Jesus told him, he said, you will be a witness not only to the things you have seen, but also to the things with which I will appear to you. Verse 17, delivering you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. And this is Paul's commission. Verse 18, this used to be the watchword of the Lydia Auxiliary in the Baptist Convention years ago. To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So he gave an account of his commission, and number three, he gave an account of his ministry. How he began to do everything Jesus told him to do. I know you must have heard about verse 19, where Paul said, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Every one of us here, the master would want us to be able to give an account of our conversion, to be able to give an account of how we ran with the Great Commission and how we have done this. Before we move on, I'd like to raise a very serious issue with us. 
when we give our lives to Christ, on the spot, we became saved. We became redeemed. We became worthy of heaven immediately, right? You and I would expect that immediately we give our life to Christ, we should be transitioned and we should just go to heaven. Really? The thief on the cross, Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise, right? And the guy's assignment ended. We would, want, we would all want that, right? We want to be in heaven. We walk on the street of gold. We want to sing with the angels. We want to wash the one who came to die for us forever and ever and ever and ever. But it's not so. Why? Because we have a mission here. We have a ministry here. Just like Apostle Paul was called to minister and be a witness. So this is the call. I'd like us to look at the words of Jesus about what would happen to everyone who believes in him. The first text I have there is Matthew 5, from verse 10 to 12. Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. We are actually looking at Apostle Paul as a case study here. Those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you. Please listen. These are the words of Jesus. Jesus did not say, blessed are you if. He said, blessed are you when. So, when here means it's only a matter of time. We all will at one point or the other be persecuted for the sake of our faith. We all will need to stand to defend our faith one day, someday, somehow, somewhere. The next text I would quote is from Mark, the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 13 and verse 11. And this is also the word of Jesus. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Remember, he said, and when. He did not say, and if. You know, if he had said if, it's a conditional phrase, right? But he said, when. The truth is this, beloved. We may not stand before Festus or Felix or Agrippa, but surely in our day-to-day -day walk with the Lord, as we live on earth, a time will come when we must defend the faith we have received. My third and last text there is from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10, and verse 16 to 20. Matthew 10, 16 to 20. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpent and innocent as doves. Verse 19. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious. It did not say if they deliver you over. So the truth is, it's a matter of time. Apostle Paul had lived this life and Luke had written the account for us to learn from. It's now your turn. It's now my turn. It's now our turns to stand for Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12. 2 Timothy 3, 12. The Bible says, indeed. And you know when you say indeed, it means for a fact, assuredly, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now let somebody tell me, who is not mentioned with all? All means all. Boys and girls, men and women, young adults and elderly adults, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. Thus, we have come to a point where we must call to remembrance 
that everyone who desire to live godly will be persecuted. It's a matter of time and when. Somebody's going to hate you because of Jesus. Somebody's going to want to cheat you because of Jesus. Somebody's going to want to ride over your head because of Jesus. Somebody's going to want to tell you how foolish or how stupid you are because of Jesus. In fact, somebody's going to want to run around and come ahead of you in line, and they would expect you to keep quiet because of Jesus. I agree, you may not be sentenced before a king, and nobody may put a spade or a, or, or a, a um, sickle around your neck. But there would always be a point in time when you need to stand for the Lord Jesus. And so, we may not be imprisoned and we may not be whipped today. We may not be sawn into two today. In fact, we may not be brought before judges and kings to defend our faith. But our everyday living will bring us to a place where we are expected to identify with Christ. And as Jesus promised, the Holy Spirit will give us boldness in our defenses. Three things the Lord would want us to do. Number one, boldness to share our faith. And I'm giving us this assignment today. Think back of how you gave your life to Christ and make that your primary story to witness to other people. Number two, the Holy Spirit will give us boldness to stand for him. Where other people are denying him, we need boldness to stand for him. You know, we live in a world today like we, we studied in the Bible study this morning. We live in a polarized world where people want a way to wriggle around the truth. But the Lord will want us to stand for him. To call a spade a spade. A sin is a sin, regardless of whoever is committing it. And the third is boldness to speak the truth. You know, today, we lack men with courage who could speak the truth. The Lord is depending on you and I. Remember that God is at work in us. Philippians chapter 2 verse 13 says, It is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So it's not about you. Apostle Paul could not have done all of this alone. He could not have, you know, he could not have gone to the stand and he could not have spoken the truth. By the grace of God, next week, when our pastor will be preaching, the first thing we will see is how, to a great degree, even the kings and the rulers felt convicted to the point where they said, look, you almost trying to convict us to become a Christian. We are almost there. And that is what the Lord wants you and I to do. Stand for the truth. He would want you and I to share our faith. He would want you and I to stand for him. The question is this. Can the Lord depend on us? The, the story of Acts of Apostles started with the 12. It went to 3,000. It went to 5,000. It went to the deacons. And now it's only about Paul we are reading till the end of Acts of Apostles. Can the Lord depend on you? Can the Lord look down from heaven and say, yes, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. This is my beloved daughter in whom I'm well pleased. As you go this week, I can tell you there will be opportunities for you to deny Christ. Don't. There will be opportunities for you to stand for the truth. Please stand. There will be opportunities for you to witness the gospel and, and share your faith with people. Please do that. Don't be afraid. This week, share the gospel with at least somebody. And my prayer is that as you do this, the one who has called you, who is faithful, will pick your word and bring sons to glory. Please bow your heads. Let's pray. Jesus Christ said we should not say that the time of harvest is far. He said, but we should see that our salvation is closer now than ever before. I'm going to ask you to just pray two prayer items. And the first is, Lord, help me to stand for you. In this fallen age, in this fallen world, help me to stand for you. Come what may. 
help me to stand for you. The second prayer I'd like you to pray is, Lord, help me to defend the faith. Help me to stand for the truth. I'd like to make two invitations this morning. And the first one is this. If you are under the sound of my voice and you have not surrendered your life to Christ, it means you have nothing to offer your world as a witness. Today is the day of your salvation. The desire of God is that all men will come to the saving knowledge of Christ. And it's as simple as ABC. A, acknowledge that you are a sinner. B, believe that Jesus Christ came to die for you and he wants you to believe in him. C, confess your sins and confess Christ as the Lord of your life. If you want to do that, Elijah will be here. I'm going to be standing here. We well, don't mind coming. If you would come to the altar, we will lead you to Christ and we will want to pray for you. The second invitation I want to make is, are you here under the sound of my voice? You have always found it difficult to share your faith. Every time you want to do that, you are run by either through fear or, or you just feel like I am not up to this. You want to truly say, God, help me. As a song of response is being sung, the altar is open. You can come to receive strength. The Bible says that we should approach the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find help in time of need. So as we take that song of response, if you want to come to the altar and pray and ask the Lord for strength so that you will be able to share your faith with others. And today, I know the Lord will do amazing things in our hearts as we lean on Him. Dear Father, thank you for your word. Thank you because you have called us to defend the faith, to stand for the truth, to share the word, and to be able to be living examples of your word. Holy Father, I ask that we will be true defenders of our faith, that we will live for you, and all the days of our lives, we will represent you well in this fallen age. We love you, we give you glory. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.